Hi, I'm Dr. Kate Cordell, and I'm here to walk you through this research brief. This is research performed by myself, Himan Shu Rao, and Dr. John Lyons. It is called Authentic Assessments, a Method to Detect Anomalies in Assessment Response Patterns via Neural Network. A little bit about myself. I am a co-founder of OPICA, Managing Director of Mental Health Aid Alliance, Assistant Professor at University of Kentucky, uh, helping with special projects uh, in Dr. John Lyons' group, as well as Associate at San Diego State University. Um, my goals in my career are to improve the ability to use information to support person-centered care, and ultimately to create a more success-focused approach to care so that we can reduce bias uh, and improve our ability to measure and identify what works for whom. So the background of this research is that uh, measurement-based care is where we're at and it is the future. We need to identify how people are recovering so that we can learn from that. Um, and so this research capitalizes on the fact that uh, we are beginning to do more measurement, but it also recognized the fact that there's limitations in our ability to measure progress in care, that many of these assessment tools, questionnaires, and surveys are often inauthentic or anomalous. The patterns in them don't really represent the true circumstances that underlie the situation for the person in care. And there could be many reasons for that. Um, they could be just incomplete, somebody could have gotten bored and quickly answered them, or could they just could be inaccurate. So this is a CANS. Um, the CANS here is a child adolescent needs and strengths, and you can see it's been filled out with a particular pattern. And this response pattern here may represent the true circumstances of the person and the family in care, um, or it could be inauthentic. And there could be some missing information or patterns in here where maybe the questions sort of should have been answered slightly differently or something should be indicated where it's not. So we took 43,000 of these types of assessments and we evaluated the patterns and responses for these. So in practice, what we found is, and this is probably makes a lot of sense, some patterns exist and appear more often than others because these aren't random situations. Circumstances are often grouped together. One example is this, is if let's just look at the life functioning domain. So if we were to just take the eight items here from the life functioning domain and identify actual versus non-actual items and pull out all the records for people who had one actual item in the life functioning domain, it is much more likely if they have one item that is actual, that it be the family alone, than the legal item alone. So we can see here that there were 2,300 records that had one actionable item with family alone, but only 122 that had legal alone. The idea here is that with legal, there's likely to be other life functioning um, areas that should have been identified as actionable. It's rare to have legal without other areas. It shouldn't be the only one. Similarly, if you look at those with two, it's more likely to be family and living situation. Most popular pattern there. The least popular pattern, school and developmental alone without some of these other areas. This would be considered an unlikely pattern in the data. So what we did was we, in step one, we dichotomized the data looking for actual versus non-actual items starting there because we had to reduce the dimensions, meaning there was too much variability across zero, one, two, or three, we have to get it down to something manageable for our statistical models. And then we group the data together and we look for groups of items that seem to be correlated with one another. So as you can see here, there's six groups. And then among these groups, you can see that, for example, when depression was identified as actionable or present, sleep was also identified as actionable or present. So meaning when somebody was experiencing symptoms of depression, they were also experiencing lack of sleep or struggling with their sleep. So this is where we're identifying where items are correlated together. And we use this to help us identify how to group these items into 10 groups of six related items. And so you can see um, we've group, grouped sleep and depression here together in group two. And then here we have um, a group one that may go across different domains. So this is five items in the trauma domain, but it did, did pull in adjustment to trauma from the behavior and emotional domain. So it would, can go cross domain when those items are very highly correlated. So now what we did was we took those groups of 10 and we looked for what were 
typical or atypical response patterns. So let's take the first group, for example. We have emotional abuse, physical abuse, witness to family violence, and adjustment to trauma. And let's say that all of those first four are actionable and neglect and attachment to loss is not actionable. We can identify if this pattern is occurring more often than we expect to see it or less often than we expect to see it based on that correlation pattern. So it should appear in the data about 22 times, statistically speaking, if it was uh, occurring at ch by chance. But in fact, we see this pattern a lot more often than 22 times, 22 times. Therefore, it's identified as a likely pattern. This is a pattern that's likely to exist in our data. Now, if we remove the uh, indication of emotional abuse and we change that to non-actionable and we leave just physical abuse, witness to family violence, adjustment to trauma, Statistically speaking, if this were to occur by chance, we would expect to see it 126 times in our data set. But in fact, we see this pattern well, way less often than that, because when there is physical abuse and uh, trauma to witness to family violence and adjustment to trauma, this is often also an actual item. It's unlikely for emotional abuse not to be also occurring here. So therefore, when this pattern occurs, we call that an unlikely pattern. Now, we can run through all the data statistically without having to look at it and quickly evaluate all likely and unlikely patterns. Then what we do is we do something in the research that um, was influenced by person fit statistics, so inspired by person fit statistics, where they look for Gutman errors. Gutman errors look at, you know, response patterns that are unlikely to occur. There are some assumptions in person fit statistics that don't apply here in terms of having correct and incorrect responses and ordering of increasing difficulty. We don't have those same ability to say there's a right or a wrong way to mark each of these items. It's a circumstance that's present or not in somebody's life. But being inspired by that approach, we identified unlikely patterns and counted those rather than counting Gutman errors. So now we have 10 groups of six. We're looking at the patterns in these 10 groups, and each record could have zero to 10 unlikely patterns, or what would be counted as Gutman errors, similarly. So what we did is we took all 43,000 records and said, how many unlikely patterns did each one have? And you can see most of the records had zero, one, or two in this histogram. So the majority of the records here had few of these unlikely patterns. But you can see up here, once you get to five unlikely patterns, it appears that the, this is where your anomalous data or your um, a data with a lot of unlikely patterns is going to occur. This is where your data quality is probably being reduced. So the next thing we did was we took all of the 60 items and we put them into a neural network labeled as normal or anomalous in the entire record. So we dropped, we're no longer grouping them by groups of 10 and six, item, six items. We're putting the whole thing in without any grouping with the entire record identified as anomalous um, or normal. And then for the ones in the middle that had three to four unlikely patterns, we just didn't put those in the model. We left those out because we were unsure whether those were, you know, had a data quality issue or not. We were fairly sure that if they had zero to two unlikely patterns, that maybe they were just some unlikely circumstances, but the data was pretty high quality. But if there were five to 10 unlikely patterns, there were probably some items that were missing or there were some patterns there that uh, needed to be evaluated further. So we trained our model with 75% of the data and tested it with 25%, and then we applied it to the three to four unknowns. So we left out the unknowns at first. Uh, once the model was trained, we let the model identify how many of these unknowns were likely, uh, excuse me, were anomalous or normal. So when we look at it across all of the different um, labels, so we have our three here. This is our records with zero, one, or two anomalous, excuse me, unlikely patterns, zero, one, or two unlikely patterns. Here's our three or four unlikely patterns, and here's our five through 10 unlikely patterns. So these were the ones we labeled anomalous. So you look at those with zero unlikely patterns, and we look at how the model did, it said none of those were uh, anomalous. It, it identified just 13 of those with unlikely patterns as anomalous and 165 of those with two, so a small proportion, but still it was starting to find some anomalous patterns here, 
um, anomalous records across by looking across all 60 items together. Um, whereas our labeling was only looking within groups of 10. This approach was able to look across all 60. And then you can see here, it was identifying many of these on the, uh, with high numbers of unlikely patterns whoops, as, uh, as anomalous. So 92% of those with five were anomalous with five unlikely patterns. And then in the middle here, when we put the three to fours in, it was finding increased proportion of, uh, of those records as anomalous or having data quality issues. So 23% of those with three unlikely patterns and 56% of those with four. So this is giving us an indication that uh, the model's working very well and that it is finding increasing number of uh, data quality issue among records that had more unlikely patterns. Overall, it found 26% of records with a potential data quality issue. When we look at our um, test results after training, we had an 88.6% positive predictive value with 84% sensitivity, meaning those that were labeled as anomalous were found anomalous 84.5% of the time. And then the those the specificity is those that were labeled as normal were found uh, identified as normal most of the time. So how would we want to apply this method? Well, we could use this method to clean our data or at least set aside records with data quality issues prior to evaluating um, our outcomes so that we could get a better idea of how people were doing and care from data that we could rely on. Another thing we could do is we could flag these 26% uh, of those records for clinical review. So instead of doing clinical review on the CANs in a random fashion, we can look at the 26% that have been flagged as likely needing review, saving time and improving the quality of our data even further because we know where to look for improving the data quality. The final thing we can do is we can use that 26%, uh, compare them against the uh, normal records and identify areas specifically where they're abnormal or those patterns are unlikely and pinpoint that, for example, when we showed earlier, that emotional abuse was more than likely needed to be marked as actionable along with those other items. We can quickly get to that because now we know where to look because we've identified likely and unlikely patterns and we can see which patterns would be more likely to occur when we're seeing those unlikely patterns. So we could very quickly pinpoint where to improve the data quality and what to dig into deeper if we've overlooked areas of circumstance so we can address them sooner in care and not wait for them to progress to a level um, of high intensity need. So if you're looking to do this method, um, basically this is saying here that we could have done this with a lot fewer records. We could have done it with about 5,000 records, we used 43,000 because that's what we had on hand, but you can apply this method with a CANS with 30 questions or a CANS with 60 questions. Um, the more questions you have, the more data you'll need if you want to look across those um, unlikely patterns. But in this example, we could have done it with about 5,000 records. So I thank you very much for your time. Feel free to reach out to me at kcordell at opica.com if you have any questions or you'd like more information about our research. Thank you.